Thank you. So Brian hit on it in our talk right there about yeah. the, the, the issues of production. Yeah. Um, it's a serious sticking point in defense media and reporting. Yeah. So, you know, the U.S. has to sustain itself, Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, and others. Is existing infrastructure enough? Is there a workforce to maintain it? And then is there money moving fast enough? Yeah, so um, I think it was in my confirmation hearing in uh, February of 2022 that I said it's all about production and production's deterrence. And of, uh, and of course, we've been saying it all along about production, production, production. And since I've been in the job, I've been had a lot of time to think about it, test some hypotheses, and check some things out. And a couple, I would just say, the issue we have is fundamentally a resourcing issue right now, both here and internationally. Um, we found that if you have the resources, sometimes you might like, not like the timelines initially, you can get the production ramped up. And we were doing it across many systems. It's really getting the resourcing and sticking with it. Um, industry is not going to do it on its own, and th nor would I if I were them. So, with the administration changing, yes. Uh, where will you put all this inertia? Like, the, there's so much attention paid to ramping up, like 155s, for example. Yeah. With an administration change, do you change? Does that inertia change? Does it get reapplied somewhere? Or do you imagine that has a, a decent tail? Well, I think. Let me just talk about the world situation Please. for a moment, regardless of the election, whatever way the election went. Um, it's a cliche to say it, but it's a very dangerous world. Just yesterday, what happened in the Red Sea, the Houthis are getting um, scary. They now have ballistic missile capabilities, anti-ship that are, that are long range and uh, can do things that are just amazing. And this is the Houthis. Okay, um, and then of course you know the situation in Ukraine and of course Indo-Pacific. Uh, we now have two, two near peer, peer nuclear adversaries. We've never had that before. Never had that before. It's just the world is an incredibly dangerous place. And I think no matter how you look at it, at least for me, and I talk, I talk all the time to partners and allies, I realize that our countries are going to need to have more political will, unfortunately, to start mobilizing or preparing for mobilization, if you want to call it that. That's what Putin has done. He's probably at 10 to 15% of his GDP. He's, he's tripled his production across the board to working 24-7. Uh, that is not what other people are doing, including us. So the Houthis are scary. Is that partially because they're effectively draining SM, no. you know, SM stockpiles? Or I mean, I know you've talked about you know cost per shot, yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. That's all. That's all true, and that's always something. Yeah. The cost ratio has got to got to be better. No, it's not that. It's scary. As somebody, I'm an engineer and a physicist, and I've been around missiles my, my whole career, and and I, I'm just being careful here what I can say because I don't want to go over any line. But just what I've seen of what the Houthis have done in the last six months is something that I, I'm just shocked. I mean, does their, does their action also speak to like the, this it's, growing demand for unmanned, right? Because it's, it's surface vessels, it's subsurface, it's, that stuff air. Is, that stuff to me is not that, not terribly surprising because that's easier. What I, you know, we all think that it's the, the one-way drones, which are a big deal, or unmanned, uh, you know, surface ships and the rest of it. But it's the fact that you have this group producing thousands, you know, thousands of ballistic missiles that are not, that I'll just say, can do technical things that, that, that only the advanced countries could do. And they're producing them at, at some degree of scale. It's just, it's just remarkable. And what they're seeing is they're seeing they're moving to ballistic missiles because a one-way UAS is very bad, or UUV, but if you have a ballistic missile hit a, hit a, a, a surface combatant, that's a very bad day. So let's pivot away from, from the Red Sea. But I'm uh, using that just as an example. Yes. Um, what are some investments the Pentagon can make now, or its suppliers can make now, to shape and secure the future? I, I think, obviously, this morning, Replicator might come to mind. Yeah, I, I think what suppliers need to do is what Brian was just talking about. <clears throat> Companies like his and others, and I've talked to them, have to really say to yourself, um, what would it take, and just pick a number, to go five times my production rate? What we did, what we did for 155, this we told this to President Zelensky, is just on a December of 2022, we looked at the, at the rates that the Ukrainians were using it. We were producing 14,000 a month at that time. And it was clear that they're gonna need much more than that. I pulled a number of 100,000 a month out of the air, called the CEO of General Dynamics and said, stay in your chair without breaking the law. 
how can you get to 100,000 a month? And, and she was shocked. Um, and of course the army was shocked, everybody was shocked. But once they started working on it and we started getting the money to them, they're, they're gonna get there. They're already at 50,000. They're gonna get to 100 next year. That's what you have to do. You have to, so, so every company should be saying, what would it take for me to go five times my production rate? I was gonna say, so how, how does the US approach production differently if orthodoxy has brought us to this point? You cannot skimp on production. And production has been the bill payer since the end of the Cold War. It still is a bill payer. We still have situations where at the end of the budget, to balance the budget, people lower production numbers because that's where the money is. Mm -hmm. We have to stop that. We have to actually increase the production rates. And a quick thing on what Brian said about the backlog. We've got this vicious, a virtuous circle, the opposite of a virtual <laughs> circle on backlog. It goes something as follows. If you're an industry, some degree of backlog is actually good. It, just, it, means, it means that you've got a demand and you've got guaranteed orders, right? So, you know, it's like when we had an addition put on our house, we had to wait a year to get the builder we wanted because it was a backlog because he was a very good builder. So part of it is that. But what happens is then people say, well, I want one. I want one. Well, you're going to have to get in the back of the line. That's three, four years. Oh, it's this industrial base. Mm -hmm. They can't support it. Well, they could if somebody, if we funded industry to double their production line, but, but it's a circular argument. And then what happens is we cut it either in the Pentagon or on the Hill because we say industry can't do it, so why give them extra money? And everybody's happy. <laughs> it's, what's wrong with that picture? Because the industry is fine. They got their orders. The, you know, the people, the budgeteers get to, take, get to keep their money. And we don't get out of this vicious circle. We have to get out of it by what we did like with 155. We said, you're going to, like Patriot, right now we're at, uh, a, we should double the production rate of Patriot. It's going to be a lot of money, but we should do it. And, and instead, what people will say, which I, I don't agree with, oh, there's a backlog, so why give them more money? Well, that's a, you never get out of that circle. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have to change. So earlier this year, you publicly recommitted the Pentagon and the Air Force to the Sentinel nuclear yeah. missile, yeah. missile endeavor, um, which, you know, as has been reported, is suffering some cost projections, some right. soaring cost project projections, and some soaring timelines yeah. as well. Um, how did you think through that recertification and just kind of bring us into your brain there? Yeah, so it, it, it was actually pretty prescribed. The Nunn McCurdy uh, statute has five things that you, that you must do, that the person in my job must do. And it's essentially revalidate that there's still a requirement, revalidate that there isn't an alternative that's cheaper. Um, there's about three or four, get to root cause, look at the management of the program, um, and then still, is it relevant to national security? We went through all of those steps. And it, what jumped out at us was the answer on all of those was yes. I went into it with an open mind. I, I you know, was prepared not to, not to recertify it. And I will say this about- So you were persuaded, almost. If you, if you went into it, it was, with it, doubts. Well, I didn't. I, I, you try to, when you're a job like mine, you have to keep an open mind. You have to just yeah. say, look, I'm going to find what I'm going to find. Um, I don't know what I'm going to find. Well, what we did find was that the ground segment, which is that the missile was pretty fi was fine. All the attention had been put in, at Milestone B and earlier on the missile. And we know how to do missiles, look, generally. The ground segment hadn't been done since the 1960s, which are these facilities that are underground, a launch facility, an LCC, power, all that stuff. That had not been designed. They had, the assumption had been made they were largely going to reuse a lot of stuff. Turned out that was wrong. And when they went back and re-looked at all the ground segment, we realized, oh my gosh. And we, we brought in heavy construction people and realized it was a, it was a different animal. Mm -hmm. um, once we went through that, then you look at the world you're, we're in today. And the, the world has said we're going to have a triad. Uh, that's the policy. That's the president's policy. It's been the president's policy for 50 years. So you'd have to change that policy, which is not an ANS decision. So if Sentinel is that necessary, how do you hold the Air Force and Northrop to account? If, if, if the ruling is we need this, does cost even matter? It does matter. Of course it matters. Well, we talked in the, earlier about a KPP. Uh, the, the B-21 is under cost because we made it a requirement that it had to be $550 million in 2010 dollars, and they're meeting that. Mentioned earlier in the last talk about uh, the NGAD, NGAD did not have a cost requirement, which I think was a mistake, and I think that's why we were ending up with these two or three hundred million dollar price tags. For this, we have a requirement that we're going to levy on uh, and, and hold Northrop accountable on what the number needs to be, 
and, and, and that's it. The other piece is that we're gonna compete different parts of the subsystems. The other piece that's completely changing is we set up an entire red team of systems engineers to red team everything being done by the program in Northrop Grumman. It's a fundamental relook, and I, I did a review of the program about a month ago, and it's a, it's a very different program They're in, in a good way. It's, but they're gonna have to stick with it for the next, uh, next five, 10 years. Well, we could talk for hours, yeah. but unfortunately we are out yeah. of time, Dr. LaPlante. So thank you for joining the Axios thank stage. You. And to our audience, yeah, round of applause, please, before, before we get off the stage. <laughs> to our audience, please sit tight for a quick word from our sponsor. And then after that, I, I'll be back again uh, with some exciting guests and a final demo. Thank okay, you. Thanks, thank you. Okay.